This afternoon, uh, we have departed from our traditional uh, a annual meeting keynote, and we're going to a little something different rather than a elect elected official. Telling agricultural stories is vital in today's world. As the general public gets further and further away from the farm, their understanding of agriculture grows smaller and smaller. Our keynote speaker today is Trent Luce, a man who makes his living telling folks about the importance of agriculture. Trent produces and sends his radio programs from wherever his travels take him using his laptop, computer, and the internet. He presently has a radio listening audience of about four million people, and he can be heard on more than 100 stations across the nation. Trent frequently can be found addressing agriculture and non-agriculture groups alike. Among his favorite audiences are our nation's youth, where he takes the opportunity to talk with them about the importance of food as a matter of national security and the value of their involvement in today's food production system. He and his wife, Kelly, operate a purebred limousine and Angus herd. They enjoy working cattle, training horses, and raising their three daughters on their ranch in central Nebraska. Let's give a warm Farm Bureau welcome to Trent Luce. Thank you, sir. Thank you, David. I'm told this is on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right. I can't see you, but I think you're out there. What a pleasure it is for me to be back in Mississippi and perfect timing to follow our recognition of ag ambassadors because it is high time that all of us learn to be better ag ambassadors. And I, I came in yesterday and I had the great opportunity to spend time with the young farmers and ranchers last night and uh, really issued a challenge and, and really I know that every one of us sit back and we identify the disconnect that exists between food producers and food consumers, but then it, it somehow follows up with, well, I'm a member of Farm Bureau and I got David Wade out there doing it, so I really don't need to. He'll take care of it and all of the wonderful staff. And really, the answer to the question in expressing what it is that that sign says, the voice of Mississippi agriculture, is that we all accept some level of responsibility in explaining the culture of farming and what it means to not only those of us in agriculture but 310 million Americans and ultimately 9.2 billion people in the world in 2050 according to the United Nations. Ten years ago I decided that we needed to do a better job of telling the story and it happened because I was actually ranching in western South Dakota at the time and a guy by the name of James Cromwell came into western South Dakota and he was talking, he had a group of 300 people that were listening to him, and he was talking about the day that he was riding his Harley Davidson on Highway 54 through southwest Kansas and Oklahoma, and if you've been in that country, it is a livestock agricultural paradise. Well, that's not exactly how he phrased it, because he was talking about riding his Harley Davidson, and he said the stink and the smell from the hog and cattle factories was so bad, he had to turn around and go the other way. And then he said, you know, and I've decided right then and there that I was going to do whatever it takes to put animal agriculture out of this country. Now, first of all, I found it somewhat ironic that a guy's talking about chasing hog and cattle production from the country while he's riding a Harley Davidson, something that we consider to be a hog. <laughs> but I also realized that he is going to tell that story every single day. And unless someone who has hands-on experience starts explaining why it is that we need, in particular, animal agriculture, they're going to begin to believe him. So I found a way, I actually just walked into, one week later, I walked into a guy's radio studio in Spearfish, South Dakota. I walked in, I said, hi, my name is Trent Luce, sixth generation United States farmer, and I want my own radio show. And this was in May of 2000. Jim Thompson looked at me and he said, yeah, you and every other American. And then I sat down. He said, you're serious. I said, in fact, sir, I'm not leaving until we get a deal. And long story short, six months later, we began producing a radio program together, and then I began producing Loose Tales. And I think that there's an interesting story in this for all of us. Loose Tales, as I began this program, was a daily look at production agriculture. 
And after two years traveling the country, every time I'd drive past a radio station, I'd pull in, I'd go in and introduce myself. Hi, my name is Trent Luce, sixth generation United States farmer, and I produce this radio show called Loose Tales, where I tell the story of production agriculture. And after two years of doing that, I had about 12 mostly AM farm radio stations telling the story. Now, what's the problem with that scenario? Does it sound like a rhetorical question? <laughs> Preaching to the choir. And the choir is too quiet, but yet we've got to get beyond the choir. And then I did a, I accidentally did a tremendous thing. I was in Washington, D.C., had a meeting with a guy by the name of John Doyle, the Center for Consumer Freedom, and we were talking, and I said, well, I'm going to go down to NPR when we get done here and talk to them about getting on the radio. John Doyle looked at me, and he said, well, do you have an appointment? I said, what? He said, well, you can't get through that iron curtain without an appointment. I said, obviously, sir, you don't understand the power of a black hat. <laughs> well, what happened was I had a sit-down meeting with a program director for NPR, and I told her the same story. My name's Trent Luce, sixth generation United States farmer from Nebraska, living in South Dakota at the time. And I produce this daily radio program called Loose Tales, where I tell the story of production agriculture. And the lady looked me right in the eye, and she said, Sir, we can't talk about agriculture on NPR. It's boring. Apparently, there's two people in the back that listen to NPR. <laughs> and I came home thinking, agriculture is boring. The essentials of life, the conversion of natural resources into human consumable products that enables mankind comes from agriculture. I can sit here with a lady who's in charge of national programming for NPR, and she can tell me that agriculture is boring. And the next time that I walked into a radio station, I remember it clearly, it was Omaha, Nebraska, it was a classic country FM station. I walked in. I said, hi, my name is Trent Luce, sixth generation United States farmer. I produce this radio program called Loose Tales, where I identify the people and places in rural America that truly make it what it is. Oh, you mean like a cowboy Charles Kuralt? Yeah. <laughs> and eight years later, you can hear Loose Tales in 19 states on 100 stations because I learned how to position what it is that we do in a way that people think they are involved in. And I think to a large degree that the challenge that we have is that we want to come up here and we want to tell the story of agriculture, but we always start with, I'm an eighth generation farm. And, you know, like my new friend Glenn, whose family's had Missouri fox trotters on the same place for, since 1895, the oldest place. And that's the history and heritage that we want everybody to understand. And the truth, the sad truth is that the average soccer mom in this country doesn't care about our history and heritage. What they care is about what we do today that improves their family and their kids. And that is how we have to begin to tell the story in a way that they can relate to and that they can understand. You know, I just about got held up here because Gary King cornered me back there and wanted to know who I was, where I was from. I don't know what he was selling yet. I'm sure I'll find out later. But the most common question that I get, just like Gary asked, how big... Can your ranch actually be if you're never there? Because I, I mean, do you know how you know you've been gone too much, too many nights in a hotel room? You come home and instead of turning the faucet on, you stick your hands under there and you expect it to just automatically come on. <laughs> you know, then you know you've been in a hotel too much. I spend about 200 nights each year in a hotel for for the last two years. This year again had the opportunity to speak in 38 states, 14 times in the state of California. When you ask me, it's a fair question to ask me how big my operation can actually be, and it's time that I just fess up and let everybody know it's just as big as my wife can handle, <laughs> which is why I ask people from now on just to call me the rancher's husband because it's a lot more accurate in this description. But we do have 150 beef cows. We've got 25 sows. We've got about 50 horses. And... Uh, 70 or so meat goats, unless they've irritated Kelly since I left home and she had another liquidation, which happened two weeks ago. But anyway, you know, as we all now, and I want to just tell you something, 
We're all concerned about the disconnect and the lack of understanding food production in the United States. And in the second week of October, I was in Lexington, Kentucky for a meeting. It happened to be an all-tech global beef and dairy summit. 60 countries present. And guess what the number one concern in South Korea is? Guess what the number one concern in Argentina is? In China, all the people that were there, their number one concern is the people who we feed don't know who we are. It's not unique to Mississippi. It's not unique to the United States. It's a global issue. And that is not, by the way, the consumer's fault. It's our fault. Because as my story that I intentionally shared with you about explaining how we capture the attention is because we're very poor at telling a story in a language that the non-farm person can even understand. And I learned this the hard way the other day in the Detroit airport. Because as I told you, I'm a rancher's husband, and we had been kidding goats at the house for about two weeks, a couple of months ago, in August actually. And the last thing that I do every time when I get on a plane or I'm in the airport is call home and check with Kelly to see how things are going and like I said, we'd been kidding goats, so I sat down in my seat on the plane, and I said, Honey, did we have any more kids today? <laughs> Another set of triplets? Well, needless to say, when I hung up the phone, the lady sitting next to me wasn't very excited about my wife being home having triplets, and here I am in the Detroit airport. <laughs> you know, and I started thinking about all of the things that we say on a daily basis in agriculture And there's no way that people outside of our small community would even begin to understand what we're talking about. And I'm a pretty slow learner because the other day I made the same mistake. I was in Chicago O'Hare. I told you we've got 25 sows. We're doing quite a bit of artificial insemination. And before I left that week, I had weaned three sows. I had them in a pen next to the boar. Kelly just needed to heat check them. Siemens in the basement and she breeds them. I'm standing in the middle of Chicago O'Hare, and she's telling me that really they're not in good standing heat. And I just blurted out, I said, well, I wouldn't waste a semen on them. (laughs) And I began looking around, and I thought TSA was going to cart me out of this place because they got some wacko over here. And you and I know, you know, and I started thinking about this. All of the things that you and I say, particularly if you're in the livestock sector, that people are wondering, what's wrong with you? Things like... I knew we should have castrated those guys last week. (laughs) Well, just call the doc and we'll get him semen tested. You know, I share the enthusiasm of the mule-headed farmer pen because I do raise a few mules each year. We've got three donkeys on the place at all times. It's not uncommon for me to be in the Chicago O'Hare Airport or Denver International and say, Honey, did you see my ass today? (laughs) They don't get it. Well, did you at least milk her out? You know, all of those things that you know, oh my goodness. And then last June, I was speaking at the Northwest Ar- Ar- Poultry Festival in Jones, Arkansas. Not in Jones, Rogers, Arkansas. And I'm sitting in the audience thinking, thank God I'm not a chicken breeder. I'd be there in the airport saying, well, we've been breeding them to have larger breasts, bigger thighs, and plumper legs. <laughs> you know, we do that every day. And then we come together in meetings like this, and what is our common theme? They just don't understand us. How would they ever understand us when we do not communicate in a way that they can actually grasp? So if we're going to educate, we must absolutely understand, number one, where to start, and number two, how to communicate. My all-time favorite story, which I know... Mr. Wade, there's a few people who've heard three or four times now, but I have to share it because it is spot on. You know, I drink a lot of coffee, just kind of wired that way, but I hate those lids. You know, they put those little flippy lids on those coffee cups in the gas station, and you get your coffee, and you tip that up, and that sticks in your nose. You spill coffee on your pants, and you wonder, why did I get the lid? So I go lidless. And the other day, I'm in La Crosse, Wisconsin. I walk in, the young lady behind the counter about Randy's age, about 50, old enough to know better, looks at my lidless cup of coffee, and she says, is that coffee? No, it's water. Oh, you smartass, our water looks like that here in La Crosse some days. (laughs) And then for no reason whatsoever, the guy behind me in line, he pipes up and he says, yeah, it's because the fish have sex in the water. 
I turned to him and I said, is there water the fish don't have sex in? <laughs> Once again, the young lady behind the counter says, you guys quit pulling my leg. Fish don't have sex. <laughs> Ma'am, how is it that we get more fish? Oh, I never thought about it. She lives 100 feet from the Mississippi River where fish are having sex on a daily basis, making more fish, and she never thought about it. And this is the person that you and I come together in meetings like this and we say, we just need to educate them. How do you educate someone that doesn't understand the first thing about the cycle of life? And in my opinion, the most important thing that I'm going to share with you today is the lack and fundamental understanding of our state legislators, of our nation's legislators, of our regulators, and the average everyday citizen who doesn't understand that everything lives, everything dies, and death with a purpose gives full meaning to life. And that is what agriculture is about. It's about enabling the life of plants and animals so that at the end of the day we improve human lives. And I'm also going to tell you one other thing. As I look around the room and I see the average age, which is representative, by the way, the average age of the United States farmer. Maybe the greatest concern that we should have with fewer people on the farm is not necessarily that we will not produce enough food to feed 9 billion people in the world, but we won't have enough people who understand life and death and work ethic. I'm thinking about in my own family. I can remember Libby, who our, our oldest daughter, when she was four. We were AIing a group of cows in western South Dakota one day and breeding them to a bull called Incognito. When we work cattle, our kids are right there, you know, flying feces and all. The kids are right there with us, either in the back of the pickup or shoot side or wherever the case may be, just like it is at your house. And after we'd been doing this for a couple hours, I look over in the back of the pickup, and Libby's playing there with her stuffed pig, and I said, Libby, what are you doing? AIing my piggy to incognito? <laughs> Let me tell you, four-year-olds can be pretty creative with used AI rods. But the moral of the story is that at an early age, our kids understand the facts of life and understand reality from not. And we're now at a point in time, I'll just tell you, we've got more adult Americans sleeping with their pet than another adult American. That concerns me. 84% of all pet owners consider themselves to be mother or father of their pet. Yesterday, flying from Denver to Houston, there was a, a very nice young lady sitting next to me. She had her nine-month-old chihuahua with her. And once everybody figured out she had a dog, they started filing by. Oh, can I pet the puppy? She's so cute. If she had, and when the puppy would whimper, they would say, oh, well, that's, it's just not fair to her to be all cooped up and traveling like this, the poor puppy. And had that young lady had a nine-month-old baby with her that was crying, what would most people have said? Why can't you shut that kid up? In fact, here's how bad it is. All airlines now have a place where you can go online and figure out how well you treat, they treat your pets before you take them, which I don't have a problem with. I have three dogs at the house. I wouldn't think of saddling my horse going to work cattle without Apache by my side where she has been for the past 10 years. But we don't have a place online to go see how they treat the elderly or babies or handicapped. But you can find online how they treat your dogs or cats. Fastest growing segment of the insurance business. Health and mortality for the pet. Fastest growing segment of the insurance and, or uh, of the estate planning. Estate planning for the pet. I used to tell people that. They'd come up to me and they'd say, oh, loose your nuts. And unfortunately, Leona Helmsley died. I don't think that came out exactly like I intended it. But... She cut her grandkids out of the will and gave her dog $12 million. What does a dog do with $12 million? Hire a really good attorney. Wait, that's no longer a joke. We have a regulator in the Obama administration, Cass Sunstein, who openly states we've reached a point in time when animals should be able to sue people. That's the world that we live. We have people giving their dogs nudicles. Does anybody here know what nudicles are? Somebody. 
Okay, what's your name, sir, on the end there on the right? I can't see you. They got these great big old bl- floodlight. Lee. Lee, what are nudicles? Lee's proud of this. He stands up, let you all know. <laughs> they are implants. They're artificial testicles that people are putting in their neutered dog because they're afraid when their dog is walking in the park next to the dog and still has his real testicles intact, their dog might lose self-esteem. <laughs> now, when did we ever consider our dogs to have self-esteem? Oh, and we're willing to spend upwards of $1,000 to give our dog self-esteem. I'm curious, Lee, what'd you spend? (laughs) He got a special. He didn't spend that much. You know, and you put all of that into the context of where we're at today. And you have people that know. They absolutely, their conscience is telling them, we're spending too much money on this dog. We're treating this dog like a kid and we shouldn't be. And instead of fixing the problem, what do they do? Along comes an organization called the Humane Society of the United States, the richest animal rights organization in the world, have annual revenue each year of $100 million. Do you know how they get that? Because people inherently feel guilty about what they are doing to their own pet. And here's Wayne Paselli talking about we're out there every day working for animals. He never tells them that half of 1%, less than half of 1% of their total revenue goes to any animal. But they're lobbying every day to shut down animal agriculture and hunting. But because people inherently feel guilty about how they're treating their own pets, they give them money because they're working to alleviate the problems with sows and gestation crates. Or those terrible horse owners who send their horses to a horse harvesting facility. They mislead people and collect a lot of money doing it. And that is why we're in the position that we're in. But I have to tell you this, that we are in a pretty good position when it comes to taking the life of an animal. Because we believe in providing all of the proper animal welfare. And for me, animal welfare is not some complex formula. It's quite simple. Making sure that the animal has access to feed and water on a daily basis. Providing protection from Mother Nature, who I don't need to tell anybody in Mississippi how cruel she can be. And protection from predators. You know, I'll get those people, particularly in California, that come up and say, well, I only eat free-range chicken. Do you know my definition of a free-range chicken? A chicken that gets free aerobic exercise every morning because a coon, a skunk, or a fox thought they looked like a great morsel. (laughs) And I don't have a problem with people that want to eat free-range chicken, but don't tell me that's how we should raise them all. But that is proper animal welfare. And once we accomplish those three things, then the final part of animal welfare is render the animal unconscious immediately and respectfully harvest the animal. Because the animal has lived its life and now it is here to improve others. And we do a tremendous job in pork, beef, chicken, lamb, and goat industries of rendering that animal unconscious and harvesting them with respect. But you corn farmers, you haven't even thought about what you're doing yet. Now think about this. You got this combine with this corn head on it. It's got these roller things on there. You don't even kill the corn plant. You just mangle it down to the ground. You rip the baby away from its mother. You put it up in this hopper. The baby's hollering out. The mother's hollering out. You go through the field harvesting 28,000 stalks per acre without giving a second thought about it. And as you sit there snickering, I think you'll be surprised to learn that three universities on the North American continent are studying whether or not plants feel pain. Guess what? They do. We've determined that plants not only feel pain, but we've now determined that the plant has the ability to have cognitive thoughts and knows whether it's related to the neighboring plant and more aggressively or less aggressively seeks nutrients in the soil based upon whether it's related to the neighboring plant. Now, for any of us in the cattle business or any type of pasture management scenario, for a long time we've known this because how many of you have ever seen a spot in your pasture where you have one thistle? Hell no, it's like a family reunion over here. You got one, they're sending it. We didn't know they were sending out text messages and emails saying, come on over here, we killed the grass. (laughs) Only a nation where things come as easily as they do in the United States do we study whether plants 
feel pain, and if plants have cognitive abilities. Tell me, do you think this is something that's high on the research list, or let's say in Ethiopia? Absolutely not. But we are human beings, and we have it, such an abundant supply of food because the United States farmer and rancher has done such a tremendous job of year after year utilizing a land-grant institutional system like you have at Mississippi State, having three legs of the stool, research, development, extension, teaching, and we apply that to the land and we improve the efficiency and make those essentials of life available more every year. To me, somewhat inspired by Randy and Lamar both, the, the worst travesty today in food production, it's what's happening in the dairy industry. I doubt whether you're in the dairy industry or not. Lamar tells me there's only 125 dairymen left in the state of Mississippi, so I doubt that many of you in here are involved at all. But we have 80% of all teenage girls calcium deficient. We have 50% of all Americans calcium and vitamin D deficient. Our per capita of fluid milk is at an all-time low since 1940. Mayo Clinic reports more, more bone breaks and more fractures, more poor bone health than any time in recorded history. All of these nutritional deficiencies in a population that's overweight and the very person who supplies calcium and vitamin D to the marketplace has struggled to make it for the past two years. In fact, we now have dairymen, who I think is mis a misguided scenario, looking and talking about the quota system so that we can cap how much milk we produce. That is wrong when you take into consideration that the very products and the nutrients that are produced from the dairy cow improve human lives in two ways that we're not getting enough of. That is what agriculture is about. It's not about being the number one economic stimulus for the state of Mississippi. We love that. It should resonate. But agriculture is about converting natural resources into human consumable products. Food, fiber, pharmaceuticals, and fuel. That's what we do. In the dairy industry, the other success story, everybody right now, it's, the buzzword is green. Are you green? Well, there's nobody more green and more sustainable than the dairy industry. Individuals who continue to implement modern technology. You look at what Cornell University documented two years ago, two and a half years ago. They showed that today's dairyman, compared to 1944, utilizes produces with the same gallon of milk produced, they only consume 35% of the water that they did in 1944. It only takes 10% of the same land mass to produce a gallon of milk today that it did in 1944. Oh, and if you care about this, we omit 63% less carbon per gallon of milk produced than we did in 1944. If General Motors had a car that was as green as today's dairy cow, CNN wouldn't stop talking about it. And when was the last time you heard somebody talking about the efficiency that's happening in the dairy industry? The beef industry is a similar story. We have the same exact number of cows that we had in 1955, and yet we produce twice as much human consumable protein. Not to mention all of the other byproducts. You know, and, and we got into this story. Randy actually sent me down this path because he had a conversation on an airplane that I have every single week. There's a word that comes up every week in my travels. Hormones. Hormones are bad. I don't know if you've heard. They're the worst thing you can possibly have. In fact, I like to share with them that we wouldn't, none of us, be here if it wasn't for a hormone, but that's a little over their head. So we back up. In fact, I'll be just walking through an airport, and I'll get people to come up to me, and they'll say, I never understood the first question, but it's always the same. Are you a real cowboy? Well, ma'am because it's typically a 30, 40-something-year-old career woman who legitimately has concerns about the crap they hear about their food supply. They have kids at home that they're trying to feed properly, and they get all of this noise from Internet folklore, 
even from misguided pediatricians. She'll come up to me and she'll say, are you a real cowboy? And I always answer the same way. Well, ma'am, it depends on your definition of a real cowboy. Mine happens to be anyone who is willing to follow the spirit that resides within themselves to see a task to completion and then willing to accept the responsibility of the end result, a real cowboy, if that's your definition, and yes, I qualify. Whatever. What I really want her to know, she'll ask, what are you cattlemen putting in the nation's food supply causing these girls to reach puberty at earlier ages? I am so glad you asked me about that. Because you see, our young girls today are reaching puberty 18 months before their mothers. 24 months before their grandmothers. But I'm curious. Do you know what hormone we use in the beef industry? No. We call it estrogen. Oh. And you can see little lights beginning to flicker in her head because she's thinking, wait a minute, I have estrogen. Yes, ma'am. In fact, what I would like you to know that if you were to take a three-ounce serving of organic or natural or grass-fed, all tremendous options for you as a consumer, no safer, no healthier, no more nutritious, but a choice that you have as an American consumer. If you're to take that three-ounce serving that's never had any additional hormone added, you would get 1.39 nanograms of estrogen. If you're to take the same three-ounce serving of beef from a conventionally produced steer where the protocol is to give them two administered doses of estrogen, you would get 1.89 nanograms of estrogen. 1.39 compared to 1.89, is that statistically significant? Wait, the average garden salad has 1,200 nanograms of estrogen. The average cabbage leaf, 2,000 nanograms of estrogen. The average tablespoon of soybean oil, 28,000 nanograms of estrogen. And ma'am, you're not taking birth control pills, are you? Because the average birth control pill has 34,000 nanograms of estrogen. So you can see why I'm a little bit frustrated that you're worried about the hormones in the beef supply and you're putting 34,000 times that same hormone in your mouth every single day and you didn't even know it. And depending on how the conversation is going, I might then ask, and you don't know where we get those, that natural estrogen we put in those pills, do you? No. Oh, this is cool. You see, we take these pregnant horses, we collect their urine, we separate the estrogen out of the urine, we put it in a pill, and you put it in your mouth. Isn't that neat? <laughs> and that it's about the time that she'll say, oh, that's my plane, I gotta go. <laughs> wait, ma'am, wait, there's more, guess what? 27 countries across the pond called the European Union, they have the same concern about science and technology and what they call food adulteration. They do not allow us in the United States to send any of our beef if we've ever given this nasty hormone to our cattle. They don't allow their dairymen to use recumbent bovine somatotropin. They don't even allow crop producers to use biotechnology in crop production. And guess what? Girls in the European Union are reaching puberty 18 months before their mothers, 24 months before their grandmothers. How can it be that two countries who have such vastly differing views on food production and modern technology have the same exact phenomenon occurring. I have a theory. My theory is that not enough soccer moms globally have ever developed a group of breeding heifers. Because you see, if you want in the beef industry a breeding heifer to reach puberty, and to calf by the time that she's 24 months of age, what is the first and most important thing you must do to her, David? Feed her. Get her body fat level up high enough so that the day that you want her to really come into puberty and give her a, a, a prostaglandin, she will respond. Or we put a bull in the neighboring pen. And either one will get that heifer to come into puberty at an earlier age, if and only if she's at a high enough percentage of body fat. Now, let me ask another question. Our young girls today, percentage of body fat higher or lower than a generation ago? Not even close. Higher. Compared to two, years, or two generations ago, off the chart. Now, another question. Do our young girls have access to more or less sexual stimulation on television, on computer screens than they did a generation ago. 
off the chart. You got two and a half men on 24-7. And are we to somehow think that that's any different than developing a group of breeding heifers? But I will give you a bit of personal advice. If you're in an airport or any public place comparing a stranger's daughter to that of a breeding heifer, a pair of fast shoes comes in handy because not all mothers get it, okay? <laughs> and for those of you women who are going to come up later and say, but what about the boys? I'm pretty much convinced that since the beginning of time when the doctor slapped the baby's butt and said it's a boy, puberty has begun, and I don't think anything's going to change that. So let's just get that out in the open. One final thing that I want to share with you about the EU, which is really a pet peeve of mine. Right now, we have so many people that start every sentence by saying, well, we need to put a ban on biotechnology because the EU did it. We need to ban antibiotic, antibiotic usage in animal agriculture because the EU did it. Here's what they never tell you. The EU in 1997, 20% of the food consumed by the EU consumer was imported and today it's doubled. In 13 years, their imported food has gone from 20% to just at 50%, one in two bites. Nobody ever tells you that the per capita cost of food has increased by 33%. Those are the stories that we got to bring front and center. And that is, my friends, a celebration of what has been a comp. Why is it that we always talk about the number of farmers that leave and all of these things, which I fully have sympathy for, but at the same time, why don't we talk about celebrating the success stories and the survivors who through mandated ethanol misguided percept or, uh, initiatives, we still have the United States consumer going to the grocery store and spending less than 10% of their food or 10% of their disposable income on food. We had at Thanksgiving last week turkeys selling at 77 cents a pound. That is a success story for the American consumer. And everything that we do has to be put into the context of we do it for you, the consumer. That's really what agriculture is about, improving human lives around the world. I have one more San Francisco story that I want to share with you. As I mentioned 14 times this year, in California, and I've been using San Francisco as kind of like a little pet project because, quite frankly, I figure if I can pull things off and explaining agriculture in San Francisco, I can do it even in Jackson, Mississippi. I was called in April of this year by the, a guy by the name of Seth Dalton. Seth Dalton had recently been hired by the Cow Palace, owned by the state government of, of California, to put the cow back into the cow palace. I don't know how many of you know that the cow palace story was built in 1941. They have a grand national, which is very similar to the Dixie National right here in Jackson in February. And poor leadership allowed that to fall off. It's, it's a daily city right outside of the city limits of San Francisco. And poor leadership had allowed that to fall off to the point where they didn't even have one last year. So they hired Seth Dalton to put the cow back into the cow palace. He called me in April and he said, Trent, I've been told that you're the guy that can help put the pizzazz back into the cow palace and get people interested and, and, and excited once again about the cow palace. So I said, what do you want to do, Seth? He said, I want people to come. I was driving down the road. I remember coming home. I was at Bartlett, Nebraska. I hung up and I said, well, let me think about it. Two hours later, I called him back. I said, here's my plan. Let's establish a contest where the, we, we go to the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, we get buy-in from them, we establish a contest where every business who wants to participate in San Francisco brag about how they use the cow in their store. Now, people obviously say, well, if you're a restaurant, that's great. But I challenge you to walk the streets in any town and look in a store where you can't find a component of a cow. Photography shops, that painting that we just sold has a component of a cow. Every tire made in the United States has steric acid in it, which comes from a cow. You know, if you think about that the tire doesn't have a tube, and yet it holds its shape right on that rim, that is made possible thanks to steric acid from the cow. 
104 life-saving pharmaceuticals come from animal agriculture. Every single surgery in America has a product called Throbin that is what prevents the, the patient from bleeding out while on the table, promotes coagulation. That comes from a cow. I can walk down the streets, look in every store, and find a component of the cow. So I said, Seth, we go to the Chamber of Commerce. We explain to them what we want to do and to let their business members who want to participate proudly display a banner saying, we use the cow, and here's how. And I said, call the chamber, let's set up a meeting. So in the middle of May, I flew out there, Seth Dalton, myself, and Maureen McElvoy, we sat down. She'd been at the Chamber of Commerce for 27 years. Seth told her he was going to put the cow back into the cow palace. He said, Trent's here because he's got an idea how to engage the non-farm portion of San Francisco in this project. And I explained the project. Maureen McElvoy looks at me and she says, well, Trent, your timing is quite good. Because here at the chamber, we've decided this year that we don't know enough about modern agriculture. And she said, you might be shocked to know that we've actually been going to your website for the last six months, pulling tidbits about modern agriculture and putting it in our newsletter. Once I picked myself back up off of the floor because I was shocked, yes, indeed, that somebody in San Francisco even knew I existed or agriculture existed, she said something that was a lesson for every single one of us. She turned to Seth Dalton and she said, Seth, I've been here at the Chamber of Commerce for 27 years. And this is the first time that anybody from the Cow Palace has come to talk to us about getting involved. It hit me like a bullet between the eyes. We are really good about sitting in this room with like-minded people complaining about the 310 million Americans who don't know who we are, what it is that we do, and we've not walked up to them and asked them to learn more. It's our fault not theirs. And to me, that's great news because that's the easiest one to fix because every single one of us have a story to tell. The person that you look at in the mirror every morning is the best qualified to explain what it is that you do every day in the conversion of natural resources into human consumable products that improves human lives. That's my definition of agriculture. That's the God-given talent that we have. It's about improving human lives. You show me a country that doesn't have agriculture, and I'll show you a country where people are struggling. And now we have it so good here, but we take it for granted. And that's your and my calling to say no more. We have to find a way to explain who we are and what we do. Final thing that I want to share with you today is, is a newer revelation to me, but it makes perfect sense. I did not grow up in a military family, although I had uncles that were involved in the National Guard. And about six years ago, I was speaking in Portales, New Mexico, at a joint meeting between the Roosevelt County Farm Bureau and Cannon Air Force Base. I was giving the same type of presentation, talking about the disconnect. And when I finished, a commander for the Air Force came up to me and said, Mr. Luce, I came here this evening not knowing anything about agriculture, but what I now understand is that you and agriculture share the same frustration that we do in the military that 310 million Americans don't understand who we are, what it is we do to improve their life. And again, it was like an awakening. I came home and I got to thinking, the two most important people to the future of our country, to the future of national security, are the troops, the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen, the marines who for now 234 years have been willing to risk their lives and everything about their family to travel the country to rid oppression and to maintain a free opportunity for the next generation of American citizens. And right alongside that is the farmer rancher who converts the natural resources into human consumable products because a country who is dependent upon another land for food is vulnerable. And the sad irony is that the two people that are most important to the future of a free America are the two people that most Americans know the least about. So I started suggesting that every Friday we wear a red shirt to say thank you to the men and women that for 234 years have protected you and my freedom, and that wasn't my brainchild. I found on the Internet that at the end of World War II, the ladies' auxiliary for the VFW started this, 
as I find David, most women start things that men try to take credit for later. And I said, why don't we do this now? And then we started making red shirts that say, Americans in agriculture, we support the troops. And in the past four years, we have, by promoting them on the website and on the radio, we've put about 400 of those red shirts out. And then I got a phone call from a lady in Montana named Avis Hoff, who called me two, a year and a half ago. She said, Mr. Luce, I listen to you every morning on the radio station in Williston, North Dakota, talking about supporting the soldier and the farmer. And we'd like to adopt that as our theme for this year's Miss Montana Scholarship Pageant. Would you be willing to send us 24 of those red shirts and not have all 20 of the Miss Montana Scholarship contestants wear them in the parade on Friday, June the 13th in Glendive? Miss America is going to be here. We'll have her wear one. Miss Montana last year is going to be here. We'll have her wear one. And we would invite you to come and be a part of the parade if you would like. I said, Avis, actually, I have a team of Percherons and a 1908 Newton chuck wagon that I plan to get into all 50 states featuring a vet veteran at my side and bringing a greater awareness to the two most important people to the future of this country, the troops, the veterans, and the farmer rancher. I said, if you'd find me a veteran to ride with me, I'd, that would be just awesome. She called me back the next day. She said, Trent, I've got great news times too. Lee Rovig, a Korean War veteran is excited about riding with you. Dave Amundsen, a Vietnam War veteran, is equally excited about riding with you. And if you'd be willing to come two hours early to Glendive, we'll go down by the railroad tracks, by the gazebo, line up your horses and tie to your wagon and have the 24 young ladies take a picture with you and your horses. And I said, take a picture with 24 beautiful young ladies. I'd come two days early. <laughs> picture went well. We go down to the staging area, Lee Rovi gets in the wagon, Dave Amundsen gets in the wagon, we go through the parade, we get to the end of the parade, I'm always carrying my recorder on my hip, I jump off, I interview Lee Rovi, say thank you for your time served, I interview Dave Amundsen, I say thank you for your time served, but the entire time that I'm talking to these two American heroes, I'm still kind of worried peripherally about where my horses are, each way a ton could do a lot of damage in a town. My daughter, who was 10 at the time, is riding her horse around in a strange town. She has a friend with her. Miss America's here. Wouldn't mind interviewing her, you know. All of these things peripherally are going on. But I thought at the end of the day, what a great event. Jump in the pickup. I head home. Get home on that Sunday evening and get an email from Lee Rovig's daughter on Tuesday that said, Mr. Luce. Our entire family would like to thank you for giving our father the great honor of riding with you in your chuck wagon and Glendive on Friday. Because probably no one told you that our father obviously shared the same passions that you have in life and that he ranched near Plentywood, Montana his entire life. He had a wagon that was quite similar to your wagon and a team of Percherons that were eerily like your Percherons. And he even participated in the 1989 recreatment of the Western Trail from South Texas to Miles City, Montana. So for you to grant him the opportunity to ride with you is awesome, and we say thank you. And probably no one told you that the day before the parade, our father was diagnosed with cancer and given X number of days to live. And quite frankly, I was pissed. Why didn't somebody tell me when I was there that this man shared so many passions that I have in life? Why didn't somebody tell me that this man was just diagnosed and given, for all practical purposes, a death sentence? I could have done so much more. I, couldn't have got, I could have got to know Lee Rovig so much better if I had known these things. And I remember that Tuesday jumping in my pickup, driving that night to Des Moines, Iowa to speak at the Iowa Turkey Growers Federation. And it was about halfway across on that journey that I looked in the rearview mirror and I said, Trent... It wasn't their fault. It was yours. Because too many things on the periphery seemed to be more important at the time. And the more I drove, the more I thought about this is exactly the position that we're in in agriculture. Is that we are busy doing a tremendous job taking care of the land and the livestock. But we've always got the fence that needs to be fixed a little better. We've got the tractor that's not running like it should be. We've, we're faced with the time levels. We're faced with the marketing decisions. The day-to-day -day grind keeps us 
completely focused away from telling our story and keeping track of what's going on over here on the periphery. And I am saying that there's one easy way to tell the story of agriculture. And Randy did it on a plane. I don't remember a month ago or however long ago it was. And he still maintains a communication with that lady because he said, here's what I do in the dairy industry to provide a safe product for you. There is no silver bullet that we're all going to just jump on the bandwagon. I applaud the effort of the PR campaign. I applaud the positioning of the mule-headed farmer, which could have been a negative thing, but turned it around and said, we can make this a positive thing. All of those things contribute, but at the end of the day, the way that we win the public favor and we gain the appreciation of 310 million Americans is that each one of us, one day, one person at a time, tell them what it is that we do to improve their lives. Because the most important aspect of that comes back to what I close with every time. It's the people. Whether it's the military, you, you talk about science and technology, look what's happened in the military. You talk about science and technology, look at the efficiencies in your farming operation compared to when you started or when Grandpa started. But what bit of that science and technology was implemented without the most important resource that God gave us, and that is the person. That's why I tell you that it always has been and it always will be the individuals, not the institutions that have made the United States of America the greatest place in the world to call home. And I challenge you to just go tell one person every day what it is that you do to make that happen. Thank you to everyone in Mississippi Agriculture. I look forward to visiting with you throughout the rest of the day and on my next visit. Thank you. Thank you.